Well, good afternoon. My friends, we've made incredible progress over the past few weeks. 31 regions have entered stage three of reopening, allowing more businesses to open safely and more people to return to work. In the last 24 hours, the vast majority of the public health units are re reporting five or less cases in their regions. After consulting with the Associate Chief Medical Officer of Health and local medical officers of health, we're announcing today that Toronto and Peel Region can proceed to Stage 3 on Friday, July 31st at 12.01 a.m. For businesses and people in these regions, this is great news. It's another massive step forward. My friends, we've made incredible progress. But as we all allow restaurants, bars, and, and theaters to reopen, we need everyone to stay vigilant. Wear a face covering, practice physical distancing, and wash your hands. And don't, and I repeat, don't have large parties or gatherings. For our friends in Windsor-Essex, we're asking the people there for a little more time and patience. They entered stage two a little later than everyone else. So the health officials just need a bit more time to evaluate the numbers there. And I'm confident that we will get Windsor-Essex there very soon. My friends, we are making real progress. Today's numbers are very, very encouraging. The reality is, until we find a vaccine, COVID-19 is here to stay. But today's numbers should give us some hope. We're on the right path and nowhere is that more, more progress, more clear than in our long-term care homes. Nearly all of our homes have stabilized. We have completed proactive testing in every home at least twice. And as of June the 18th, family members have been able to reunite with their loved ones. And it's all thanks to our frontline healthcare workers, our personal support workers, and our nurses and doctors who have worked day and night to fight these outbreaks. And I want to thank the families of our residents for their patience and for their sacrifice. It has been a very difficult period and the losses have been far greater than anyone could imagine. The outbreak highlighted the cracks within the system that has been broken for years. It was a crisis decades in the making. My friends, as I always say, our government didn't create this problem but I can promise you, we're going to fix it. Because our seniors deserve better. As Premier, I stood at this podium and made a commitment to the residents and families that there would be accountability, that there would be justice for them, that there would be answers. Today, we are delivering on that promise. We're appointing an independent commission to conduct the full-scale investigation into COVID-19 and long-term care. The Commission will be led by Associate Chief Justice Frank Morocco, who has practiced law for 33 years and worked on a number of high-profile cases. He will be supported by Angela Koch, a former OPS executive with 27 years of experience in modernizing and reforming government, and Dr. Jack Kitts, a former President and CEO of the Ottawa Hospital and one of the most respected healthcare CEOs in the entire country. Together, they have decades of experience. They will conduct as many interviews as necessary. They will require records to be produced and they will summon as many people as they need to. Until we get down to the bottom of this, no stone will be left unturned because our seniors deserve nothing less and our government will support that work all the way. I look forward to receiving their report next spring. And we won't stop until every senior across Ontario has access to the care and dignity they deserve. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll hand it over to Minister Fullerton. Thank you, Premier. The COVID-19 pandemic has created challenges around the world, the likes of which we have never seen before. The virus itself is completely new, and the world continues to learn new information every day. Despite our best efforts, 
COVID-19 was able to enter our long-term care homes and many families were severely affected. My heart goes out to those who have lost loved ones in our fight against this horrible virus. In conjunction with other actions we have taken, today's announcement will help protect our long-term care residents and staff from future outbreaks down the road. Our government is launching the Independent Commission into COVID-19 and long-term care. This commission will investigate how COVID-19 spread within long-term care homes, how residents, staff, families were affected, and the adequacy of measures taken by the province and other parties to prevent, isolate, and contain the spread. Above all, it will provide our government with guidance on how to better protect long-term care home residents and staff from any future outbreaks. Three commissioners have been appointed for the expertise and experience they bring to addressing the Commission's mandate. This Commission will be chaired by Associate Chief Justice Frank Morocco, who is an accomplished counsel and legal author. Chief Justice Morocco has been the leader of the Law Society and was appointed to the Superior Court of Justice in 2005. The other commissioners are Ms. Angela Koch, a former senior executive with the Ontario Public Service and a recipient of the Public Sector Excellence Lifetime Achievement Award from the Canadian Public Sector Quality Association and Excellence Canada. And Dr. Jack Kitts, recipient of the Order of Canada and known nationally for his focus and expertise in patient experience, performance measurement, and physician engagement. Dr. Kitts recently retired after 18 years as President and CEO of the Ottawa Hospital. The Commissioners have the power to conduct hearings and deputations and summon any person to give evidence and produce documents as they conduct their investigation. The people of Ontario deserve a timely, transparent and non-partisan investigation. The Commission will have the full authority to conduct their hearings in public as they see fit and will provide me a report of their findings and recommendations no later than April 30th, 2021. Our government will then make the report public. The Commission has a clear mandate which is publicly available for the people of Ontario to see. And I'm confident that the Commission will provide the government with objective, comprehensive and fulsome findings so we can be certain that we are prepared for any future outbreaks in Ontario's long-term care homes. The people of Ontario deserve nothing less. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the phone line for questions. First question, please. First question comes from Mark Douglas from 680 News. Please go ahead. Hi, Mark. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Premier, Dr. Fullerton. Uh, let's, Premier, for a question, or actually, well, yourself or Dr. Fullerton, whoever would best like to answer this, the uh, three-person commission for long-term care homes, their report is due April uh, 30th. Okay. Will there be recommendations in that report, and will those recommendations be binding? Well, that's going to be strictly up to the, the Chief Justice, uh, along with the other two committee uh, members. Uh, they'll put recommendations, but uh, if they do put recommendations, we'll, we'll take them up on it. And on, on top of that, we aren't just going to sit back. We're going to continue improving the system as we have been. Our great announcements uh, last week and this week about building new uh, accelerated uh, builds when it comes to long-term care homes, and we'll have another one coming up very shortly as well. I'll, I'll pass this over to the Minister. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, to be clear, uh, the, the last couple decades, especially the last uh, 15 years, have really been um, an era of neglect of long-term care. And that is why we started immediately as we became um, a new ministry uh, of long-term care in the summer of 2019 to address staffing issues, to address capacity issues, to address uh, many of the concerns surrounding Justice Scalise's recommendations as well. And you'll be hearing about that soon. So the work had already started. Um, we know how um, devastating uh, COVID-19 was to our long-term care homes, many of them. And that is why we are continuing to take a transparent uh, effort to make sure that the Commission provides as much guidance as possible to us. 
Uh, we want to be open-minded and transparent um, with the Ontario public. We must make this better. Follow up. Thank you. I, I hate to waste the follow-up just repeating the same question, but uh, I, did, I don't think I got a clear answer to my first question. Uh, Premier, you said, you know, if they make recommend recommendations, you'll take them up on that. Does that mean these are going to be binding rec recommendations if they even make recommendations? Well, well, again, uh, Mark, that, that's going to be up to the Commission. It's going to be totally independent. Uh, they're going to have free reign to summon anyone to make recommendations, not rec make recommendations. But I want to get down to the bottom of this. I, I really do. We, we're fixing the, the problem from now till then, and we're going to continue fixing it. But I, I need answers. I want answers. You know, I, I want this Commission to move forward. And we have uh, three very, very credible uh, people running this uh, commission. And I, I, I also want to mention, you know, I have the two greatest ministers standing behind me. Uh, one that's here every day, my great deputy premier, and, and uh, Dr. Fullerton that has 30 years as a physician, but not only 30 years, but over 30 years, but also working in long-term care. These two women are amazing. They're my rock. When I'm up here, they're my rock. They're the experts when it comes to health care. And I wouldn't know what to do with, without uh, two quality people like I have right from the beginning of this. And I, I just want to tell them both how grateful I am for, for their support. They're, they're amazing people. And uh, we're going to get down to the bottom of it. We're going to fix it after uh, decades of neglect. Uh, we're going to fix it and make sure the, the, the people in long-term care are going to have a, a quality uh, li life in, in long-term care. Next question. Next question comes from Cynthia Mulligan from City News. Please go ahead. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Premier. Hello. Um, I've spoken to a lot of experts about what's wrong with long-term care and PSWs who work in long-term care. Mm -hmm. Everyone agrees that a massive overhaul and rethink of this system needs to take place. Yeah. My question to you is, are you willing to put a price tag on this? How much are you willing to spend to ensure that long-term care is what our elderly seniors deserve? Well, it's a good question. I, I put my money where our mouth is. We're, we're putting $1.75 billion into long-term care. It's unheard of, more than any government in the history of Ontario. We're putting over 200, and I think it's $230 uh, million, uh, $35 million, somewhere around there, into helping uh, support long-term care right now, no matter if it's hiring new people or having uh, a rigorous cleaning throughout the the entire uh, system. But I'll, I'll, again, I'll pass this over to the Minister. Thank you. So thanks for that uh, the question. Clearly, uh, we have been working on this in terms of the staffing study, the expert panel uh, that will be providing its report very soon, the recommendations uh, by Justice Galise from the, from the previous public inquiry, understanding that the staffing is, a, is an issue, the capacity is an issue, and that's what we've been doing as the Ministry uh, of Long-Term Care and as a government is addressing this issue, these issues uh, when COVID hit. Um, so I, I think that uh, there are lessons learned from this, and we understand the population is aging. Uh, the Commission will assist in this process to understand how we, we address the shortcomings in long-term care that contributed to uh, uh, what we've seen with COVID. And uh, so these are all measures that we're, we're taking. Also, I want to speak to the integration of long-term care into uh, the overall health care system and with acute care because I think that is such an important aspect of the infection prevention and control, bringing the expertise uh, that we need. And, and so I'm looking very forward to the, uh, um, the expert panel report and uh, their recommendations as well. So this work is ongoing and we will have to assess um, uh, the way forward in terms of costing. That all has to be understood first. Thank you. Follow up. Thank you. My follow up is for the Premier. Premier, this is on behalf of my colleague Faiza Ning. Um, Shuler Farms is challenging the Norfolk and Haldeman's Medical Officer of Health on his COVID-19 policy of capping bunkhouse occupancy. The farmers say the rest of the province is not subjected to these rules and that they shouldn't be either. They also say they don't have proper access to testing that requires them to travel 20 minutes and book an appointment or private testing costing $140 per person. How do you respond to both of these very serious concerns? 
Well, first of all, going back to your other question, I apologize, uh, Cynthia. It was 243 million. My staff just told me about going in long-term care to answer the Halderman uh, Norfolk uh, question. Each chief medical officer has the authority under Section 22 of the Health Act to put in certain procedures and protocols and guidelines uh, in in that area. But we can always sit down and, and talk to them, and I'll, I'll ask the Minister of Health to come up and make a comment on this as well. But again, they're 34 uh, independent uh, chief uh, medical officers for, for each region. And we certainly are encouraging people to come forward for farmers to um, present their workers to be tested. I, I know that there is some concern about that because there were a large number that were identified as being COVID positive, but it actually is um, a good news story in the sense that it was dealt with, that public health went in, that the federal government assisted in terms of uh, uh, hotels and so on. So when all levels of government work together, municipal, provincial and federal, we can solve the problem. But we really encourage every uh, farmer uh, that has uh, temporary agricultural workers working with them to please um, have them tested. We can send in mobile testing groups to come to the farm that don't have to travel to an assessment center. We want to work with them to make sure that a good solution can be found so that everyone can be tested and uh, we have the resources on the ground in order to be able to do that. Next question. Next question comes from Lucas Meyer from News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. Hi, Lucas. Hi, Premier. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, uh, pivoting to education a little bit, uh, the Sick Kids uh, report recommendations, the uh, updated ones that came out today, um, they did not are not recommending. There was some disagreement on this, but they're not recommending use for elementary students. Uh, they are recommending them for middle and high school, so long as physical distancing can be maintained. Um, on these specific recommendations, do you agree with those? Well, I could never argue against medical professionals, especially at Sick Kids or any medical professional. They're the professionals. I know the minister is going to be rolling out his plan uh, this week, and he's taking advice from uh, Sick Kids Hospital, UHN, uh, other uh, hospitals throughout uh, the province, consulting with the boards. So they're they're the experts when it comes to health, and I, I highly recommend that we follow the health experts as we've been doing from from day one. Some people have concerns about these masks. Some other people are, are saying they, they should be wearing them. This is a path we're going down that nowhere in the world, uh, they really they don't know what exactly is going to happen. Is everyone nervous? Are parents are sure they're nervous? I'm nervous. Everyone's nervous when you're dealing with kids. There's going to be 2 million kids uh, going back to class and 130,000, 140,000 teachers. That's concerning, 100%. And what's even more concerning is uh, if one of the kids have COVID and they bring it home to their parents or their, or their grandparents. You, you just do the numbers. I mean, you have two million of anything, adults, kids, or in an environment, it's, you know, it's going to be a tough challenge. But uh, we'll, we'll get through it. We'll work together. We work collaboratively with, with everyone. And as I've always said, you know, because we're working collaboratively with municipalities and federal governments and health experts, uh, we're in the spot uh, that we are today, which which is pretty incredible in my opinion. And I, again, I want to emphasize this every time I say this. I play the smallest part in this. Uh, it's the people, the 14.5 million people, the frontline healthcare workers. But when you look at 28,000 tests, and we came out with 77 cases, like that's impressive. And I want to thank the people of Ontario. You, you guys are absolute champions. Uh, that, that's impressive, and when they're using Ontario as examples around the world, um, that's impressive. But again, we can't take our eye off the ball for a second. It will come back and bite us in the backside, the second wave like we've never seen before. So by no means is this, is this over. And continue practicing social distance. I emphasize, do not, do not have parties. Do not have these big gatherings uh, because we're risking everything. We're, we're really making a lot of ground, so thank you. Follow up. Thanks. Uh, and well, Premier, if you want to go ahead and confirm that that education announcement is coming tomorrow, by all <laughs> means. Uh, my uh, follow up 
uh, is uh, regarding um, what you mentioned about the price gouging in Barry and Aurelia. Obviously, you and the mayor of Barry have gone back and forth in disagreement about this. But you did mention on Friday that you were going to talk to the uh, attorney general about this, uh, saying that you jump on it. Are, are there any actual, uh, you know, legislative measures uh, happening here? So, and then about ten minutes after my press conference, I called the attorney general, and uh, also called uh, Minister Dunlop. They both represent the area of Aurelia and, and Barrie, and they were concerned. And, and uh, Minister uh, Dunlop told me a story. She went down and talked to the restaurants and, and so on and so forth and the small businesses, and they said it's, it's very quiet down there. Uh, where, where the boat launch was and where the docks are, it used to be packed. Now it's absolutely empty. And I had a staff member, ironically, the staff member... Uh, comes up to me after the press conference. He goes, it's amazing you said that. I had to pay $50 for, for parking in, in Barrie, and then I spent $100 at a restaurant. He goes, I'll never go back there again until they lower the prices. So what's happening, and I, I understand the, the mayor, what he's doing, uh, both of them. I, you know, I, I don't want to knock him. He, he thinks he's doing the right thing. Uh, but overall, in the big picture, it's, hurt, it's hurting businesses. You know, usually these places like Aurelia, Barry, Huntsville, uh, so on and so forth, they want tourists there. They want them to spend their money. And a perfect example was one of my staff members saying, I'm not going back there until they lower the prices. So what I understand through the two representatives in that area, businesses are struggling. Restaurants are struggling. Maybe things have changed in the last week, uh, but I, I, I'd like to support the businesses. I think things will level off and uh, people will go to other places as, as well. I just want to support the people of Barry and Aurelia. That's what I want to do. I don't want to be arguing with any mayors or anything. We've worked so well together. And they, they're good people, really good people. They're doing the best uh, in their mind for, for the residents. But it's hurting businesses, as sure as I'm standing here. Next question. Next question comes from Randy Rath from Sage Sage TV. Please go ahead. Hi, Randy. Hi, Premier. Um, since COVID came about, since it started, um, for-profit long-term care homes have had scores of people die in them under horrible circumstance. And during that same period, long-term care homes have paid dividends in the tens of millions of dollars to their shareholders while spending a fraction of that dealing with COVID. Um, how can anyone look at that and think that that's an acceptable situation? Well, I don't think it's acceptable, but I, I just, I, I, Randy, I, I just hate painting everyone with a broad brush. At the peak of this, absolutely at the peak, the worst scenario uh, that we're facing, uh, we, we had about 21, 22% homes, which is unacceptable. We, we had close to 80% that were clean as a whistle, and uh, they were doing a good job. But the ones uh, that we got the reports, they're going to be held accountable. It's, it's very simple. And we're building those uh, accelerated builds out in Peel and, and uh, over by Lake Ridge uh, Health and Pickering Ajax. Uh, we're fully funding it. And I, I, I love the idea, Randy, of campuses of care, meaning, you know, be it a senior's home or long-term care, either close, a stone's throw away from a hospital or attached to a hospital. And, the, you know, the, the hospitals have been incredible uh, supporting us and, and going into these homes. But, again, I'll, I'll pass this over to the, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you. So, I, you know, I understand the concerns um, regarding this, but it, it is not about ownership. Uh, there are many, many variables. Uh, that we have to remember that it's putting the residents at the centre that matters. How does the resident get the, the quality of care uh, that they deserve, that their families deserve, uh, as we move forward? And clearly, uh, you know, capacity issues in our long-term care homes, 99% uh, capacity going into COVID, uh, looking at the staffing crisis that was ongoing, and, and other issues surrounding certain regions more greatly affected than others. And we also know that um, as cases rise in a community, it's more likely to affect that long-term care home because of the staffing and the staff live in that community. So there are many, many variables, but we must absolutely put the resident at the center and their families. And that is the imperative here as we move forward. So whether it's a municipal home, a not-for-profit or for-profit home, if we always keep 
the resident at the centre so that they get the very best care that's possible and the very highest quality that's possible, then I think we have, um, we have the foundation that's critical as we move forward. Thank you. Follow up. Yeah, okay, on another subject entirely. Uh, the City of St. Catharines has decided, um, and we've talked about this sort of thing before, that their beaches can only be used by residents. Um, you know, they're public beaches. Is that an acceptable thing to see happening in Ontario, Premier? I don't think it's a fair thing. Uh, you know, we're all paying taxes. Um, everyone's pitching in. Everyone's helping out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. They're public beaches. I understand the situation in St. Catharines or Barry or Orillia, but everything's going to level off. You know, the, the, we'll be, there'll be one day that those regions are going to be begging for people to come. The businesses will be begging, restaurants will be begging for people to, to show up there. And I think we have to work together and work, work through it. And that, that's, that's what I believe right from uh, day one. I just don't believe in this heavy-handed approach all the time. Let, let's, let's work together and get through this together. That's, that's the best solution. It really is. Next question. Next question comes from Jacob Barker from CBC Windsor. Hi, Jacob. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Premier. Hi. Um, I uh, spoke. I spent uh, this morning speaking with businesses here in Windsor, many of whom uh, they feel they're ready to open. Uh, the pandemic has already had a great impact on their bottom line, and uh, this is holding them back further. Uh, it's a bit like uh, rubbing salt in the wound for them. Uh, what can your government do to help the businesses that are being affected for a longer period of time than other uh, businesses here in the province? Well, there's a, there's a raft of uh, different areas, uh, no matter if it's the, the rent subsidy that we're working with the federal government, that I believe that's being extended. Also, options for them to take a, a $40,000 loan from the the federal government, uh, there's, there's a wide range, but our number one key issue in the Windsor-Essex area is to make sure we reduce the cases. I had a, a very nice message from Mayor Dilkins, which I'm a massive fan. Windsor should be so grateful they have a great mayor like Mayor Dilkins. And just thanking us for everything that uh, the province is doing to help his region out. I had a message um, from Mayor McDonald this morning. I talked to Mayor Santos, uh, Kingsville. Uh, Mayor McDonald uh, is in Leamington, and I'll just, uh, you know, I, I got a whole list of different areas that we're helping him, and the EMAT team, I, I call them the, the SWAT team of medical professionals, or are down there, emergency medical assistant team from Sunnybrook, they're just top notch, they've had an opportunity to sit down and meet the mayor, we have EMO, Emergency Management of Ontario, we have Red Cross, Ontario Health, Ontario Provincial Government Labor, Labor Inspectors, 580 three inspections of farms, 189 orders have been issued, the federal government, the labour inspectors are down there for the bunkhouses as of June the 26th. We have Windsor-Essex Health Unit, Public Health, Minister of Agri Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, Minister of Health and Ontario Health and Minister of Solicitor General. So guys, we're, we're throwing everything and their cousin, their brother, every, everything at this to make sure we take care of the people of Windsor-Essex. They, you know, they, they, first of all, my heart breaks for them. They're fabulous people down there. They, they treated me like gold when I went down there. I'm so, so grateful. And I'm going go to go to the wall for them. Anything, you know, I can do will make it happen. I just asked everyone, please have patience. You, you, we're a week behind there, and it might take another week, but we'll do everything we can to help them get back on their, their feet and, and support them. You know, there's, there's, I'll tell you, there's a lot of love uh, from uh, province going down and from myself down to the great folks in Essex, Windsor, and I'll be down there again. I think it's next week or two weeks, two weeks, uh, two weeks. I'll be down there and I'll be going into Windsor and meeting the, the great mayor down there and dropping by Essex one more time. It means a lot to me, those people, and I, I want to get them back on their feet. Follow up. Uh, yeah, my uh, next question, it's um, on, uh, on behalf of my uh, colleagues at uh, News Network, uh, CBC News Network, and uh, so does, uh, since testing uh, criteria has expanded, Ontarians are now getting tested for COVID-19 even if they don't have symptoms because they want to go see their elderly grandparents or hold family gatherings like barbecues or cottage weekends, sometimes without physical distancing or masks. 
What's your take on this approach, and do you think our, your government needs to better inform people about the high rate of false negatives that could offer a false sense of security? Well, I'm going to pass it to the Minister of Health, but before I do, it's the golden rule, guys. Until we find a vaccine, we're living with this. And uh, we're doing, uh, I say we again, the 14 and a half million people are doing a great job fighting this uh, COVID-19. But the golden rule is to make sure you social distance, wear a face covering of, of some sort, and uh, stay out of large gatherings and large, large crowds. It's, you know, we've never spent more money on advertising ever, neither has the federal government, uh, more about educating people. And you can't turn on the news. You can't turn on a channel without uh, the media, which have done an incredible job, and I thank each and every one of you. Uh, they've, they've been, you know, really just hitting the message one after the other. So we're grateful. Everyone's on the same page. Anyone who plays ignorance on this, uh, it's just not, not, it's just not fair to the rest of the people, because they know the rules. They know the the uh, guidelines. I'll pass it over to the Minister of Health. Well, we absolutely need to protect our vulnerable populations, and seniors being among that group, and people are being very responsible. They are getting tested before they see their uh, family members, and they, uh, they know that that's an important step that they need to take. So we do encourage people to continue to go to the assessment centers, to continue to be tested if you feel that you have been in touch with someone with COVID-19, or you're exhibiting some symptoms, Please do go and get tested, but as the Premier said, we still need to continue to follow the public health rules. Just because we had good numbers today, it doesn't mean we can take our foot off the gas. We still need to be very vigilant. We still need to practice the physical distancing, still need to wear face coverings uh, where we're not able to do that. Frequent hand washing and all the other public health measures are more important than ever now, um, and testing is included in that as well. Last question. The last question comes from Christina Tenalia from CP24. Please Hi. go ahead. Hi, Christina. Hi, Premier. Hi, Minister. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Premier, you promised accountability for long-term care homes, and you also previously said that homes in the CAF report could face charges. Mm -hmm. But according to the terms of reference for the Commission, the Commissioners can't make any conclusion or recommendation regarding the civil or criminal responsibility of any person or organization. What I'm wondering is why not? How can long-term care, uh, how can long-term care owners or operators be held accountable if the commissioners can't make these conclusions if necessary? Well, we, we have uh, other uh, uh, folks looking into this as well. I'm going to pass this over to the Minister Long-Term Care, but uh, as we said, we have the uh, Chief Coroner looking into it. We have the Ombudsman looking into it. We have the Auditor General looking into it. Uh, we're looking into it and possibly, as I've always said, possibly uh, the uh, police, the OPP. And if they find there's been neglect, uh, then, then they should be charged. It's as simple as that. But I'll pass this over to the Minister. Thank you. There is a process for uh, criminal acts to be uh, investigated and go through the proper authorities. This commission is independent. It will have public reporting. It is to be um, a way to investigate the factors that led to this and how we move forward so we can prevent this from happening again. We want to be open-minded about uh, the measures and the recommendations that, that they may make or their findings. Uh, but if there is a criminal act or uh, an act that, that requires reporting to the, the police or authorities, then that needs to go through the proper channels. This is, uh, this is a, we have a, um, a associate chief justice, we have an expert in healthcare, we have an expert in, in government systems, and they will be reaching out uh, to all the different specialized experts, people with both uh, expertise in a certain field, but also lived experience. And uh, this is very important for our government to be open to the public input uh, and to be transparent and to make sure that we get to the bottom of what happened in long-term care. But for criminal issues, there's a process for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Premier. Thank you, Minister. Um, my final question is, we understand that there's an opportunity for the commissioners to hold 
public and private meetings. Uh, according to the terms of reference, it says here, as they deem advisable in the course of the investigation. But we know that there are many frustrated family members across the province and people who have been directly impacted by what has happened in long-term care homes mm -hmm. in the province. How can they reach out um, to the commissioners? How can they partake? What is the process for the public to provide their input? Well, I, I believe they'll be calling people uh, as, as witnesses, and they have the authority to call as many, including myself and uh, any minister. So uh, I, I really want this to be transparent. No one wants answers more than, more than I do, and the two ministers behind me and the families and the, obviously the, the patients. And we're going to get the answers. But again, sorry, Christine, I'm going to pass it back over to the, the minister. Thank you. Thank you. So, as mentioned, it's an independent commission. So they have the ability to to summon people. They have ability to access documents, um, but they will be determining as they see fit uh, the process. They will have at their uh, avail. They will have the um, uh, secretariat to support them in this from the Ontario Public Service. And so we are making sure that they are are resourced as they as they need um, to make sure that they can determine um, what next steps they need to make. So our intention absolutely is to be transparent and this to be independent and for those commissioners to determine what they need. Thank you. Thank you everyone. That's great. Thank you everyone.